Hi, Pray Tell, a joint venture between the School of Theology and Lit Press is broadcasting live from MPM in St. Louis. My name is Nathan Chase, and I'm the current editor of Pray Tell while Father Anthony is on sabbatical. And I would like to welcome you to our panel on Pope Francis and the Church with Paul Inwood, Sister Kathleen Harmon, and Rory Cooney. Before we start, I'd like to introduce our panel. Paul Inwood is a liturgist, composer, organist, and author and workshop presenter, and part-time music editor for Liturgical Press. In 1998, he was one of only 10 consultants worldwide, and the only one from an English-speaking country, to be invited to contribute to a conference at the Vatican on papal liturgies for the millennial year 2000. In 2009, he was named NPM's Pastoral Musician of the Year. Roy Cooney is the Liturgy and Music Director at St. Anne Catholic Community in Barrington, Illinois. His songs appear in hymnals and missalettes of several publishers and is the author of Change Our Hearts, a book on Lenten reflections available from Liguori Publications. He is the 2014 recipient of MPM's Pastoral Musician of the Year Award. Sister Kathleen Harmon is music director for programs of the Institute for Liturgical Ministry in Dayton, Ohio, and co-author of the liturgical or the liturgy preparation resource Living Liturgy. She has done extensive liturgical uh, music education and liturgy education and consultation throughout the United States and Canada. So I just want to welcome you all today to this panel. Thank Amazing. you for being a part of it. Yes. Thanks for the invitation. Yes. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, so I thought we would start with maybe a low ball question <laughs> or a softball question. Um, <laughs> what is the biggest contribution Pope Francis has made to the church today? It's very hard to limit it to one contribution, but I want to say that what impacts people the most, I think, is humility. And that's what leads him to the great openness. Um, He's a very intelligent, highly educated, accomplished person, and he's immensely humble. The thing that keeps um, striking me as I follow what he says in his homilies and what the press picks up about, about him, which I can only hope is close to the truth, right, um, is that he is not afraid to um, articulate the dissonance between what the church says in its proclamation and then the liturgy and what it's actually doing. And, and, and the way that he embodies a challenge to move outside of our kind of corporate com comfort zone and where we're happy to reside because it's safe for us and to move into the area where actually the gospel is, has been calling us for 2,000 years, you know, outside of our own walls. So I think that, for me at least, he is telling us it's not enough to belong, but you actually, all of us together, and he's showing the way himself, are, belong on a mission together, and it's, and it's not to ourselves, it's outside of ourselves. Yeah, and I think I would add simplicity to humility, simplicity of lifestyle, and simplicity when he celebrates his daily mass. He's just like an ordinary pastor. He's, you know, um, uh, there's no airs and graces, no frills and furbelows. Uh, I think I was responsible for one of the keynote um, titles for the, uh, the next year's NPM, which says, um, uh, less pomp, more prayer, um, and uh, you know that, that that's that, that's what he's about. And because of that lifestyle, the eyes of the world are upon him because he comes across as being real. He's you know he's right. he's not hiding behind vestments or you know uh, or anything else. No, he's uh, he's 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 a real guy. And I'll add to that, in that wonderful interview run in America Magazine shortly after his election, in the section on prayer, and he says, yes, every day, he said, I, I will be in the presence of the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament for an hour, I usually sleep. <laughs> and I went, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, 
No, I, I actually... Okay, yeah. Well, so, I mean, we all know Pope Francis is simple, humble, and challenging at the same oh, yes. time. So it's yes. an interesting combination of things. Um, and he's not as preoccupied with all things liturgical as Pope Benedict was during his uh, papacy. Um, and he's also willing to do a few things that we haven't seen before. Um, and maybe break or bend some rules and rubrics around. Um, so I'm just curious, what do you think that, um, you know, Pope Francis's papacy means for the average parish and liturgist when they plan their liturgies? Um, how can we use him as a model for the way to, you know, sort of be the new evangelization in the world? I'm in a average parish, <laughs> I think. Um, and. I, I think that's a, a very difficult question to ask because all of us are kind of on this edge of wanting to preserve, in a sense, the liturgy by letting the liturgy shape us, in a sense, rather than trying to shape the liturgy and into our own image and likeness, you know? So there's that. But then there's the sense where he just keeps saying to us, but don't get trapped in that box, you know? Don't, um, don't keep people away by being in with those rules. So at the parish, you know, one of the things that keeps coming up for me is kind of this sense that, uh, you know, what this one old pastor said to me recently, because I, I noticed that when he came, he was a visiting priest, so this is not go, talking out of school. He came in with his own copy of the previous Roman Missal. And that's where he read the prayers and the uh, Eucharistic prayer out of. I mean, the, I mean, he was a priest over 50 years, so he'd been around for a long time. He said, he says, yeah, this the new liturgy thing. He says, I'm about 90 percent with it. So he, what he wanted to do was to say um, that he, that he felt, I think, empowered by uh, by Francis's attitude about liturgy to kind of do the comfortable, what he felt was the right and comfortable thing as opposed to or beyond the correct thing. And I think that for, at least for us, and, and I, I wouldn't I would just be clear that I think that is a tightrope. We, we all have to be very careful uh, of not falling off of there, but um, because it's easy to start blaming the rubrics for things that are wrong with the church. Um, and it's and it's easy to say, um, well, there's no rules. And so, you know, everybody come to communion. And I think that if that's what we're going to do, well, we need to talk about that. But it, it is, I mean, it, that, that temptation and invitation are both there at the same time in my average parish. So perhaps looking more to the spirit of what the texts and the rubrics say, um, you know, as it relates to people in their everyday life. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there is an analogy, I think, you know, the, in the struggle between, say, Paul and James in the early church, you know, where James is saying, James is, is kind of insisting on the, um, the, the Jewish law, and Paul is saying the law can't save you. Well, they're both right, but it was, and it was a tension, and it was both, both of them are, of course, great saints and martyrs. So there's, there's a lot there for us to think about. And I think one of the w only ways of, to deal with that is for us to be talking about it, which is another thing that finally I feel we're invited to do by Pope Francis right. is mm. to talk about these things and not just say my way or the highway. I want to add something there that's in connection with liturgical music because the, uh, the new study that was led that came from the Vatican office, I can't remember which office, the one about music where we were asked to really assess how we were forming people in music, how we were doing music, what resources we were doing. And I know in, in the dioceses here in the United States, we were answering these questions. But there was a question that occurred in that, in it coming from the Vatican, that has never occurred before, which I, I attributed to a kind of spirit of greater openness that we have now. And the question was, in light of what is going on multiculturally, globally, is, is it now time that we need to redefine the nature of sacred music? Do we need to ask the question in a new way? We've never been asked that before. It's always been sacred music is this or not this. Um, and I think that's a real door opener for us that's not come. Right. And it was a question coming from the Vatican. So yes. it, it gave me a lot of hope. I think Francis is a man of the people. Um, and for me, that's exemplified by the fact that he has 
dismantled the six candlestick crucifix cage behind which his predecessor imprisoned himself and, you know, keep away from me. Um, I'm sure he didn't realize that it came across like that. So that's gone. And Francis has done other things too, like, you know, uh, uh, his celebrations in South America where there were additional acclamations in the Eucharistic prayer, another way for the people to become engaged in what's going on. So and I think I think that's he, he's all about people, you know, and uh, his predecessor talked a lot about new evangelization. He hasn't mentioned new evangelization because he is the new evangelization. You know, he is the gospel personified in a way, I think. And, uh, and, and he wants it to get through to ordinary folk at grassroots level. And so um, breaking down the barriers is, is a great thing as far as I'm concerned. So, so how on a practical parish level do we sort of take his, you know, image then? Because not all of our uh, pastors and priests can be the rock star sort of uh, presiders that Pope Francis is. Well, I don't think he's a rock star presider. I think he's a very simple presider. I mean, he's your average pastor. He's, he, yes, he, he, he doesn't, you know, he's not Father Game Show host and he's not Father Tridentinist or and any of these other labels. He's, 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 he's just, you know a priest who you would be very happy to see in your parish and he's not hiding behind things and he's not trying to present himself either he's doing what Rory said and letting letting the liturgy be a source of prayer for people another thing that works in the average parish for all of us is I think that Francis presides in a way that comes from an authentic personal relationship with Jesus Christ that everything he's doing is flowing out of a real relationship with Christ and an understanding that this is the nature of the church. All presiders are called to that. All members of the assembly are called to that. This is the new evangelization, that I have come to know Christ and Christ has changed my life, and this is how it shapes liturgy and how it shapes my daily Christian living. Um, it's not based on rules and rubrics. It's based on a living, growing relationship with the person of Christ and the body of Christ, which is the church. And yes, and I think in all of us have experienced what a good homilist he is. And he's such a good homilist that it's not just a benefit to his congregation, but his daily homilies are a benefit to the church. And, and people, priests and people I know, want to know what he said today yes. about scripture because it comes from his heart it comes from his head because he's a very is a brilliant man yes. and he's been around for a long time but but it's not for the head it's for the whole person it's and I don't want to dismiss the head part because I think it's very important but it comes it comes from a whole person and it is intended for all of us as you know, integrated human beings to be able to absorb the gospel in a way that's not about like an intellectual journey, but one, uh, a place that we can sort of give our hearts to and move toward together. And I think, you know, on a slightly different level, to have somebody who's on the front of Time magazine, you know, is, I mean, I know people have been on the front of Time magazine, popes have been on the, on the front of Time magazine before, but th this is different, it's very rapid, and so when Rory says it's not just, it, it's for the wider church, it's not just for the people who are listening, it's actually for the world. I think the world is hanging on Francis's words. I think, you know, he has become the spiritual leader of the world by default, um, and, uh, you know, people who are not religious at all, uh, admire him and they um, uh, look up to him and they are interested in his daily homilies as well, which I find fascinating. I think another thing for me, just in the ordinary parish, is the openness of Francis to not be rigid, but to say, I have to open my mind and my heart to alternate perspectives. And in terms of liturgical music, for example, in my parish, I want to continue to lead the people forward in talking to each other about their disagreements over the style of music and the text of music to say there is not one way. There are many ways that it will be authentic expressions of encounter with Christ and with doing the liturgy as the body of Christ. And can we move beyond the fighting and the anger sometime to listen to one another? Because Francis is modeling this kind of Let's listen to one another and not just immediately decide that someone with another opinion is wrong. Yeah. 
and that this this impacts parish life in yeah. a very concrete way. You can go if you. I just I, I was I wish I had the exact text in front of me, but I think that within the last month or so, um, in the in the area of music, he he did say something that was sort of um, shocking in the sense that you kind of inviting the church to reconsider the music that we've been using. And for instance, I can't remember the, but it really had to do with, you know, the even, for instance, the, the expense of keeping up a pipe organ in a church when members of the community are suffering, you know. And I, I, well, he wasn't saying you shouldn't do that, but he was saying we need to examine our priorities here. And um, there was other, you know, specific stuff about music and musical style, which led me to think, I mean, he certainly has not changed anything from his predecessor in terms of the in terms of liturgical law or anything like that. So I don't want to jump to any conclusions. But, you know, if the person, you know, keeps dropping these hints about, you know, a way of approaching and a, and a, and a way of a style of being church, it's certain that eventually those um, uh, hints are going to, they may not make their way into law, but they'll make their way into practice, which we know eventually becomes law in one way or another. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, uh, Pope Francis's predecessor and some of the conflicts that, you know, the liturgy wars, as they're often termed, you know, in the blogosphere at least. Um, you know, I'm a little bit curious because I think that, I mean, I love Pope Francis and he's done a lot for the church uh, in a, such a short period of time. But I sort of wonder if some of our liturgical conflicts went from hot wars, if you will, under Benedict's papacy to a sort of simmering cold war today um, under Francis. So I'm just curious as, you know, what your sort of impression is and what Francis can do to maybe flush out the conflict in a way that will be constructive um, and sort of bring the church back together? Well, part of the problem, I think, is that, um, is that, I, and I don't, I don't want to be too negative about Pope Benedict or about John Paul II, obviously, of sainted memory, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Um, but there, there was a, a concerted effort to suppress dissent even Darth Vader had to find out that that didn't work. You know, you know, you can't just keep compressing the descent of galaxies without expecting, you know, a a, uh, a blowback because that's just natural law. That's the way. That's the way things are. And um, and it seems to me that if you, for instance, if you just right now do a search on Google or some other search engine about Pope Francis and liturgy, virtually everything that you find is a negative blog about the fact that he is not what Benedict was in terms of, you know, liturgical propriety, following the rules and so forth. What he's done isn't something that everyone is, that people are out to praise, because really, what all he's done is to be a simple pastor and to show and, and what he what he I think what he realizes is that as wonderful as liturgy is it's just liturgy if I can say that just liturgy with air quotes around it and by by just liturgy I mean we've always known liturgy is not exhausting the life of the church it's a sacrament of the life of the church it's like one hour out of 168 hours of the week the other 168 hours there's life that needs to go on that flows out of liturgy and comes back to liturgy and so I, I think that by refocusing the church on the other 167 hours and kind of going through the, the liturgical rituals with, some, with a renewed simplicity, not shabbily at all, but with a renewed simplicity in kind of a popular uh, sense, what he's, done, what he's done, I think, is re-fired our imaginations and, again, refocused us on the other 167 hours of the week, which are equally important. Anybody else? I feel like I'm. <laughs> you're, doing, you're doing pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> right. We'll buy your next book as well. <laughs> Very nice. So just extending off of that a little bit, because um, you are basically talking about liturgy as source and summit. And um, I do think that Francis is causing us to reimagine what liturgy as source and summit means. 
Um, and so I'm just curious if anyone else sort of about the you know the other days of our week. Um, you know how has the the academic liturgist, but also the person in the pews, reimagining. How are they reimagining liturgy in their life? Boy, that's quite a question, Nathan. Yeah. Well, they get harder as we go on. You <laughs> Thank <know>. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the prophetic thing has always been. This is the fasting I seek. I mean, fasting is a ritual, like like going to mass. I mean, there, it's a different, okay, it's, it's a sacrament. Fasting is a sacrament. But this is the fasting I seek. Feed the hungry, attend to the needs of the poor. I mean, that's, that's the, prophetic, um, the prophetic message. And so the prophetic message has always been about not what you do on the Sabbath, but that what the Sabbath do is genuine because it, it's the way that the rest of the week is lived. So bringing kind of that, that uh, Sabbath mentality to the rest of the week, because why? That's the way God is. So you know, I, I feel like um, that what we've tended to do a lot of times is to oh, so highly focus on the church as a, as a, as a sacramental dispenser that we haven't actually preached the gospel about that the sacraments are actually sacraments. They stand for a reality outside of themselves, which is, you know, both, it's a covenant, God's love and our response to that in, in the world. And I think what he's doing is calling us back to, he, what he actually does is just, doesn't just talk about washing feet and serving, he washes feet and serves people. We see it with our eyes and we say, you know, I've been talking a lot about that, but I haven't washed a hell of a lot of feet today. And so, and so I think that's what he's calling us to. Will somebody else please? <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, the liturgy transforms us. And you said this when we started, Rory, that liturgy needs to shape us. We don't shape the liturgy to, to us and what we want it to be. I think what Francis is doing is saying the liturgy will transform us and shape us. It does not need to be rigidly done or rigidly experienced. In fact, when it's rigidly done, it doesn't transform us. It just boxes us in. It, it needs to be celebrated in a way that touches people, that is warm, but it's not really rock star. It isn't a performance of the presider. It's the presider leading us to warmly engage in the paschal mystery of Christ in the ritual. And the paschal mystery of Christ is, I will give my life so that others may have life. That's the mystery. And the liturgy keeps transforming us to enter into that more. Now, when it's done badly, it doesn't transform me. When it's too rigid, it doesn't transform me. When it's too lax, and either I as the musician or the presider or the community has rewritten it, to make it my liturgy, what we like, it doesn't transform either. Somehow Francis is offering us a way to negotiate through right, left, right, wrong into what is, what's warm, real, human, and full of grace. Right. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, you, you said, how are people reimagining liturgy, you know, following his example? I don't think, I don't think at the moment they can do that. Um, with a, uh, a translation of the of the missal, which which doesn't seem to be in in anyone's native tongue, um, and I think that's still preoccupying people. I think I think people will learn from his liturgical style. Um, I think they will learn from the fact that he's a man of peace, and that essentially the liturgy should also be a, a place of peace, a locus of peace, um, uh, and not one where people are getting. Um, uh, and I see him using texts from the old missal because they happen to be there, or, the, or at least they're printed in the, in the Vatican worship aids by mistake. Uh, oh, happy fault, I think, uh, in a case like that. And I've, you know, so in the end, he's, uh, um, I, I don't think he's worried about, about liturgical niceties. He's worried about the, 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 the spirit, uh, the spirit of what we're doing. Um, 
uh, and uh, you know if he suddenly if he suddenly um, you know changed all kinds of liturgical practices and laws I think that wouldn't be who he is he's a he's a, a very simple man but he's also a unifier so he hasn't um, cast off the extraordinary form people into outer darkness um, and at the same time he hasn't ca cast off people at the other end of the spectrum if they still exist which I think they probably don't anymore um, so I'm full I'm full of hope I just hope that he lives long enough to actually do you know and the fact that he's had so much to do with the Vatican um, uh, bank banking and finances and everything else I think has sidetracked him and I think it's very important that he's had to get to grips with that sidetracked him from from things like the liturgy that I my spies tell me that things in the congregation for divine worship have loosened up a, a little bit and maybe that's part of you know part of his example but but he hasn't really turned his attention to that you know the the when when if and when I, I say when he appoints a new prefect then we will have a, a clearer idea of the direction that he's going in uh, and that will be a real sign for people. Um, uh, it'll be a sign that we are not standing still, but that we're actually moving forwards, assuming that he appoints the right person. <laughs> when Kathy mentioned Paschal Mystery, uh, the, the word that keeps coming to me about this whole thing is doxology. And what I mean by that is, what God are we worshiping in liturgy? And what, I, what we keep coming back to with the Paschal Mystery is a God who does what Jesus, who Jesus reveals to us, you know, a God who says um, that I die for you, I, you know, I, that, that my love is so consuming that I give myself completely to you. And that doxology means worshiping that God means we act like that God ourselves. And that's where this whole, I think this whole thing comes together, uh, the way he teaches and preaches and lives his life, is makes clear that there is, a, that the God that we're worshiping is not God Emperor, God General, God Judge, but God Father, as revealed by Jesus. We're nearing the end of uh, our panel. Are there any sort of final thoughts and reflections that anyone has on Pope Francis, the church? I sense the hope in the air, which is always a good thing, so. I'll say two quick things. One was yesterday when Jerry Gallopo did the keynote for this year's convention, and he was talking about many things, but then he put on the screen there the picture of Pope Francis and said, Ray of Hope, and that the audience just applauded and applauded and applauded and applauded because this instinctive reaction to the hopefulness and openness. The second thing I want to say is personal. Francis is modeling for me a life of prayer, a life of openness, a life of being the body of Christ, that is affecting my own personal discipleship yes. in a way that no pope in my living memory has done. And I'm thankful to God every day for that. Yeah. I would just, I, I, the word I would use for that is, is uh, the pope's example and word are a call to conversion for me. It's a, and, and you know, I, when, just when you think that you're on the right track, along comes a guy who shows you that you're nowhere near where you could be. So I, I just, I feel like conversion is a, is a thing that, uh, is a word that's, that, I'm, that is suggested to me by his papacy. And just before I don't get a chance to say this, I want to say thank you for the Pray Tell blog, which a lot of us depend on for conversation and, uh, and um, information as well. And just getting the, getting the word out there about liturgy and talking about it too. So. Thank you. Yeah, I would echo that, and uh, uh, being one of the contributors, I've, uh, the, the thing that gives me hope about that blog is the way that people change, people dialogue, they don't stay in their entrenched positions. And I think that's part of the Francis effect too. He's, he, he wants people to think, he wants people to talk. Um, it's not a question of my way or the highway. Uh, and so, uh, but at the same time, he's challenging. So he's setting us free to think, but he's challenge us, challenging us to think about the things that actually matter. Um, so yes, okay. 
great sign of hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you all for being a part of this panel. And thank you to our readers uh, and viewers for watching uh, today. And um, we will keep you updated on all of the MPM events that occur this week. Thank you.